as we have been looking and continue to look through the way of wisdom and looking at Psalms and Proverbs in particular over this summer, I was reviewing through Proverbs, and as I noted earlier, 11 times in the first several chapters, Solomon says, my son, my son, my son, listen, my son, heed my words, my son, don't forget the teachings, my son. And over and over he says this, and it just made me think for a second. It's important that we pass on the legacy that we have to pass on. We need to consider what legacy am I passing on? What am I giving to the next generation? We, on this particular weekend, are more than grateful, and we'll celebrate this week with how grateful we are because of the political freedom that we have in this country, the religious liberty that we have in this country. But you know, we have a greater freedom, and that is the freedom we find in Jesus Christ. And we need to be mindful of that. In fact, I would say that's the most important freedom we can have. And the reason I know that is it, be, it does not necessitate political freedom to find spiritual freedom. Because Jesus Christ died for the whole world. He made no regard to what your politics might be. And so people all around the world are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. We have here a lot of different protective nature about us. We have some protective words for us that allow us the freedom to do what we're doing right now freely and publicly gather together to worship, to put it online for everybody else to see too, without fear of anything. Given all that has been sacrificed for us to get to this point, it begs the question, what are we going to do to protect it, and to make sure we give that spiritual freedom to those that come after us. And we need to be concerned about that. As Solomon was to his son, as David was to Solomon, we also need to make sure that we are leaving a legacy of spiritual freedom for those who come after us. And that does not just mean those in our particular family. It's, are we as a body of Christ in Crowley, are we leaving a spiritual legacy for our community? And that doesn't begin later, it begins today. And in fact, I would suggest to you, it's been going on. And periodically, we have to stop and think, how are we doing? How am I doing? We have to ask the individual question. How am I doing with leaving that legacy? And I want to encourage us through several different Proverbs today on how we can lead well into the future. And that is eight letters. And we're going to talk about each of those letters quickly. We're going to talk about those in what we can have as a next generation vision as we move forward together. And so as we look at this model today, you've got the lead well, you've got those letters in your bulletin on the notes on the back side. And I just want to give you some, some words to use with each one. The first one is to love God and neighbor. Love God and neighbor. You say, well, that's, that's, that's over in Leviticus and Matthew. That's not in Proverbs. Well, it's interesting because some of the wisdom we find in Proverbs, even over in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. If you want to play Bible drill with me today, that's awesome. Follow along. If you want to write them down and look them up later, be, feel free to do that as well. Uh, but it, Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Guard your heart. Loving God and loving your neighbor begins with guarding your heart. Because your heart can lead you astray if you are following an emotional situation, as we've talked about a few weeks ago. If all I do is ever follow my emotions, and I'm not balancing that with what God wants me to do with said emotions, then I can run into trouble. We have been commanded in the Old and the New Testament, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And, the, and Jesus would say, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. 
If we're going to lead well, if you're going to lead well, if I'm going to lead well, if we are going to lead well into the future, it all begins here. Am I loving God with all my heart, soul, strength, and mind? Am I loving my neighbor as myself? These are important questions. And what I'm going to ask of you and encourage you to do so you can come back and look at this later and give you some prayer points through the week is I want you, beside each one of those, each of the letters, I want you to, to put your score from a 1 to 10. How well are you doing? 10, man, I am perfect at this. I'm awesome at this. Of course, now none of you are going to put a 10. But you know what? I don't think any of us are at a 10. Not on this side of heaven. But where are you? You see, I ask two different questions with this L because it's important. Because sometimes we can love God, but we don't love our neighbor. And it's important. Jesus said, and the second is just like it. It's just like it in practice. It's just like it in importance. He said, how can you say you love God and hate your neighbor? You can't have that. You can't, you can't have that. If you're a nine in your religious nature, but you're a two in your neighborly nature, we have a problem. You have a problem. And if we're going to lead well into the future, we need to be asking ourselves, why, why is it this? Am I loving God? Am I loving my neighbor? Both of those things are incredibly important if we're going to lead well into the future. And so we have to evaluate this, guarding our heart. Guarding our heart. Not in a guard it from getting hurt. My friends, we're going to get hurt. Persecution's on the way. But persecution does not mean I can't love God and my neighbor. We are called by our faith to love God and love our neighbor. How are you doing in those two categories of love? If we're going to lead well, it begins with loving our God and loving our neighbor, loving each other. We utilize a code of conduct in our own midst. And it was in the bulletin for a long time, but we use the acronym ARISE, that we accept we recognize, we inspire, we serve, and we evangelize. This is what we expect of you as a, not only a follower of Christ, we expect that of you as a member of our body. This is what we as a body have agreed upon that we want to make sure that we're doing, that we're accepting one another, warts and all. That we're going to recognize, in fact, we're going to recognize later on a uh, 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 staff anniversary as Mark has been with us for several years and uh, summer got kind of busy and we're a little behind, but we're going to make sure we handle that. And uh, personnel is going to come and make a presentation to him. We want to recognize and we thank Mark for all that he does. And we're a pre go ahead, we thank Mark for all that he does. See, this is actively recognizing among us. We're recognizing people among us. We, we recognize mothers. We recognize fathers. We recognize graduates. We need to recognize others around us. In, in a sense, we recognize the faith development and journey as we baptized last week. We're baptized, we baptized this week, and we'll let you in on a secret later on. We're going to baptize again next week. We want to recognize these moments and times in people's lives because it's important. We want to inspire one another. We serve one another. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. And evangelize. We want to make sure that that is a component of who we are, is that we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which a person can be saved except through Jesus Christ. And that is the story we must tell. It's not just live it. We have to talk about it, and we have to tell it, and we have to get it out there. And that's the whole point of evangelism. Well, I'm spending a lot of time on the first one because it's very, very important. It sets the tone for the remainder of the others. So if you're clocking me, I will go faster through the rest. The E stands for engage. We must engage 
multiple generations. Proverbs 11, 14. Proverbs 11, 14 says, Without guidance, a people will fall, but with many counselors, there is deliverance. Let me let you in on a secret, and this may be a shock for some of you. No one generation among us has it all right. No single generation has all the answers. None of us do. But together, much can be accomplished. Together, much can be learned. Together means that we, if we're going to love God and love our neighbor, and if we're going to engage multiple generations, then we need to understand what other generations are like. See, we, we know our generation, but do we know other generations? Do we know the characteristics of the other generations? And you, can, you have them here. You, you know, some of you may not be able to read that. I understand. We can, we can produce this later for you. But each generation has its own set of characteristics. Now, you can say, well, I'm in that generation, but that's not who I am. Look, this is, th these are just overarching statements Everybody is a unique individual. But by and large, research has shown that the different generations have some key words about them. The oldest in the room tend to be loyal. They are known for their loyalty, their steadfastness. The boomers are ambitious and competitive. They had to be. Why? Because there are so many of you and so few jobs. You had to be competitive, and, and you grew up in a very competitive fashion. I'm a Gen X. We're skeptical. Our skepticism gets us in trouble, and our skepticism has kept us safe all at the same time. <laughs> I mean, that's just who we are. We're going to question everything, you know? We, we quit we, everything. I have stories I could tell, but we're going to move on. Millennials, they're passionate. They're passionate. Now, millennials are 22 to 42. They're not kids anymore. For some of you who think they're still kids, they're not. They're 22 to 42. They're raising their own families. But, man, they're passionate about a whole lot of things. The millennial generation, they're, if, if nothing else, they're passionate. It may not be the things you're passionate about, but they're passionate. And they have this sense of energy that when they get behind something, they can accomplish things. Let me tell you something. You don't think the church doesn't need that? We need that. We need skepticism. We need passion. We need energy. We need competitive. We need loyalty. We need all of these things. Any single one thing does not work. We need it all. And before we start looking across the room and frowning at the generations that are so wildly and radically different than we are, let us recall that Jesus died for us all. And we need one another. We need each other in this moment. And Gen Z, the, the youngest, not the youngest in the room, but our older kids and our teenagers and just about to go to college, they're just pragmatic. They are. What works? Let's do that. What works? Let's do that. And that is, that is something that we need also. We need... To have voices that come into rooms and meetings and thinkings and say, look, this is all great, but does it work? Because if it doesn't work, why, why can't we make the adjustment to make it work? And then you've got the youngest in the room, the ones that were up here with me. That's Generation Alpha. We don't know a whole lot about them yet. There's a lot of hope. But if we, we must engage multiple generations if we're going to lead well into the future. How does that look personally? Individually, we have to be open to have conversations, relationships across the generations. Don't hide out in the silo of your little Sunday school room that only has your age group. Get to know other people. Engage other people. Maybe change where you sit. I'm just going to stop there. I have gone too far. That doesn't mean closer to your wife. Yeah, I saw that. 
All right, the third one, A, actively listen. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. A fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. This idea of listening, we have to actively listen to everyone. We, we need to be actively listening. And there are, we, we all do this differently. Some, some like communication in letters, some like it in face-to-face, -face, some like it in an email, some can do it in a text, some don't want you to communicate with them at all. <laughs> That's just reality, right? But we, we all communicate differently, but how do we listen? How are we listening? And I put it this high because I think listening is a component we have lost today. We have thrown away the skill of listening just so we can get our message out. Now, this, not, I'm, this is going to put me at, at a particular age group, and, and I understand that. But there was a time, and I know all the young people are like, oh my gosh, here we go, with this. there was a time. Okay, but there was. There was that many of you recall an example of not listening anymore. There was a time when news and radio would tell you factual information. And that's it. They would just tell you, here it is. You don't have to like it. You may like it, but here it is. And today, it's less fact and a whole lot more opinion. We have lost how to listen. And largely because we've been bombarded with all this opinion. I like to listen to sports radio. That's just what I like to do. And there are some shows that I cannot, well, I can't listen to anymore. And it's for this reason alone. All they do is argue. I mean, you, you've got three of them, and they're saying the same thing, but, they're all, but they want to argue with each other. And I'm like, okay, you all used to be a nice show. And I just don't want to listen to you anymore because all you do is fight over nothing. I mean, you had, you had the hockey draft last week, and you had the NBA draft, and they argued about which should be two and which should be three. I don't care. There will be a two, and there will be a three. And Victor was number one, and everybody, they could agree with that. You know? But here's the reality. We don't listen. We don't stop to listen. We don't do it in our families. We don't do it in our churches. We don't do it in committee meetings. We don't do it in our basic relationships. We don't listen. All we do is get our opinion out there. Stop modeling news agencies you don't like and start modeling what we need to be doing, and that is to listen to each other. Listen to our heart. Listen for a little bit and see what's being said. Develop mentoring relationships. Chapter 12, verse 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but one who hates correction is stupid. See, I can say that because that's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's not in the message version. This is like a good translation here. Okay? So there's a recognized translation of Scripture. And the Greek says stupid, so I like stupid. Develop mentoring relations. I don't need to be mentored. Yeah, you do. You know why? You, don't know, you know why I know some, the older in the room, need to be mentored, and sometimes we don't think we need to be mentored? I know exactly, let me give you an example why. Try to program your TV. I guarantee you, you got somebody younger than you coming in to do that. Okay? Young people, y'all don't even know how to change a tire. Hey. Okay, that's an example. There are things that we all can learn from one another. And we must engage in mentoring relationships. The idea of a one-on-one -on -one mentoring is not that the older is just going to teach the younger, but it's that two people across a generational divide come together to read Scripture together and to say, how is God speaking to you? That's fascinating to me. I love to hear what God's doing in your life. When we begin to develop mentoring relationships, we're going to see a wonderful thing happened. 
because we're going to see God moving amongst the generations in a way that maybe we haven't seen in a while. We all need to be mentored, and we need to mentor somebody else. We, we all need that in our life. And I know sometimes we don't like to be corrected by somebody younger than us. We feel it's disrespectful. But you know what? It, maybe they're right. Hey, and, and the younger in the room, you don't like to be, you don't like to be corrected by an older person because you feel like they're just, you know, they're just being mean. No. Sometimes you need it. Because whoever hates it is stupid. We need the discipline. We need the correction. We need, sometimes we need to be called out on what we're doing it, by the Scriptures. What does Scripture say? I've said this over. What does the Bible say? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? Well, I don't know. Why do you not know that? Start reading it. And mentor. Get in, a, get in a mentoring relationship. Now, this doesn't mean to find your best buddy out of Sunday school and do that. No. You need to find somebody that's at least one generation away from you. Preferably with a generation between you. To learn from one another. To develop that relationship of honesty and encouragement and development with one another. We must stop saying they have nothing to teach me. We got to stop saying that. We have to stop saying I don't want to be taught by them. That's everybody in the room. That's all generations. I'm not badgering the old because the young ones, you guys do it just as much. So lead. Love, engage, actively listen, and develop mentoring relationships. How do we do it well? Well, we work at ministry and mission together. Proverbs 12, 24. The diligent hand will rule, but laziness will lead to forced labor. We have to work together. We've got to work at it and work together at it. But that means we also need to understand that the way you lead is different than others may lead. And leadership is important across the generations. Different generations have had as a common denominator a different style of leadership than others do. The oldest in the room came out with it, and they were command central. Why? Because they had such a military influence and a military background in them. Command and control is just what they did. And they, they commanded things. And so sometimes your grandpa, your great-grandpa might just, they're going to say it, and, you're, and that, that's just the end of it. You know, they said it, and now they're mad that you're not up and doing it. Okay, don't get mad. Don't throw a fit. This is just who they are. This is the nature that they have. And if we can understand that, we can love God and love our neighbor and love our grandpa who's commanding us. It's okay. It's okay. And they may not be rude about it. They just have a way that they've said it. You know, some of y'all can recall going into the kitchen with your grandmother. Always Wasn't always a nice affair, was it? Because grandma had a way of doing it. And you wanted to change that way, and grandma wasn't having it. We cook it this way. But grandma, mm, she gives you that look, and then you know it's done. You either have to obey or walk out. This is just the way it works. Okay, but that's just the way it is. We have to understand. Knowledge leads to a better opportunity. The boomers, they control things. They like to control things. They like to be in charge. They, like to, they fought hard to get in the positions they're in, and they want to keep them. Thank you very much. It's okay. Churches across our nation, you realize 90%, 90% of churches are boomer and elder heavy and don't have the other generations much. 
because we haven't learned how to engage one another. We haven't learned how to deal with one another. We haven't learned how to handle one another in a positive manner. If we can go into a work, a mission, or a ministry opportunity and recognize that some people are going to say things and want it done, some people are going to want to control it, others are, are more about coordinating it. If you watch through the generations, you can see how this works. Gen Xers, by and large, are wanting to coordinate things. They want to manage things. Now, I am not being rude about this, but just hear me out. Gen X, by and large, have not yet been allowed to enter into a lot of the leadership and the, those leadership roles. So we learned on the fly cutting our teeth on management because that's all we could ever do. We attained management level. We learned how to coordinate. We as a whole generation, we can coordinate stuff. We can pull this together. We can network like nobody's business. We, we see a need. We can find a, a solution, and we put the things together. And we can pull this together and that together, and we can make that happen. And that's what happens. Millennials want to coach. And this is where we get into understanding. Millennials coach people. They're going to they're gonna coach other people. They're, they're, they're not going to come in assuming they are right with everything. They're gonna, hey, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? How do you think? They collaborate on a lot of things. They're going to coach on a lot of things. And, that's just, and Gen Z, they, they just want to cooperate. Can we all just be happy? Can we all get along? Can we cooperate together? Gen Z is running from the church today. Why? Because we can't get along in a place where we ought to be able to get along if nobody else could in the world. We will not lead well into the future if we can't get it together and learn how to cooperate together. Gen Z will not have it. They're going to run. And we, we who have been in the church and filled with all our religion and our tradition are going to say, well, they're just, you know, they just don't know the Jesus I know. They just don't love the Jesus I know. No, they love Jesus. They don't like what we're doing to him. We've got to work together. Evangelism training for a modern culture. Not changing the gospel. Proverbs 18 and verse 15. The mind of the discerning acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks it. I've shared this in several spaces over the last few weeks about the need for us to reevaluate the way we go about evangelism. Hear me out. Not what we say. The gospel doesn't change. The gospel is the gospel. We can unpack that another time. But the way we go about it, there needs to be a little bit of a shift if we are going to lead well into the future. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this. All the evangelism trainings that I've received over the years, you've received over the years, had a presupposition, and it's this. There is a knowledge of Scripture that was presupposed everybody had. That's not true today. Biblical illiteracy is a thing. We don't know the scriptures like we used to. And I'm going to tell you, millennials in Gen Z and Generation Alpha, the youngest, they don't know the scriptures. They don't. And before we rail against our culture, let's realize that we created this culture we're living in. And realize that we must understand how to go about training evangelism. There is a gap. Me, an older, had a level of biblical understanding. Younger than me doesn't always have that understanding. And so now you've got this gap. And if we want to go out there and, you know, CWT and EE and faith structure and presuppose, hey, everybody knows these scriptures. They don't know the scriptures. So we have to readdress how we're doing things. And we have to readdress where we begin. I don't begin with them assuming they know Scripture. I begin with them assuming we, they don't know Scripture. Let me love them. Let me get to know them. Let me relate to them. Let me earn the right to talk about that so that we can have a conversation and a relationship. And that takes way too much time for some. But that's evangelism in a modern culture. It starts way earlier than we ever thought we had to. But that's where it is. 
So we go to Bicentennial Park this coming Saturday and we serve. We go to the police department once a month and we bring dinner. We gather water in and take it to the police department because they're dehydrated and they're, they're having a struggle this summer. We go out in the fall and we join our community. We go to the night out under the stars and corralling night out and we go invest in those, those moments. Why? So that we can love people and that our community can say they love their neighbors. They love their neighbors. But where's the gospel in that? Some of you cry. We're just not there yet. We're going to get to the gospel. But we have to not bypass the relationship that gets us the opportunity to share the gospel. And it's a process. And we've got to engage the process. There's always room for evangelism, cold evangelism, going out and just sharing. There's always room for that. And you always must do what the Spirit tells you to do. But by and large, if we're going to reach a generation that doesn't know Christ and doesn't know the Scriptures and doesn't have the moral fabric that many of us grew up with, then we have to start earlier in the process. Linger, Proverbs 18, 24. One with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. We need to linger more around here. And find our friends and bring others and find our friends and bring others and find more friends and bring others. Find your friends. Find your friends. There's friends to be had in this room. People you don't even know their name. People that you know in the back of your mind you should know their name, but you don't remember their name. And now you're scared to ask them their name for fear they're going to get mad. Yeah, you laugh because it's true, isn't it? Let me let you in on a secret. Me too. <laughs> You're supposed to know everybody's name. Yeah, you know, I am. Getting old is hard. I can squat down, but I can't remember your name. What is up with that? Look, we're all in this boat together, right? We don't know everybody's names. Oh, they told us their name. They introduced themselves. We asked them their name 16 weeks ago, and now we can't remember their name, and now we're filled with shame and guilt and humiliation. Let's all agree. Can we all agree simultaneously? Can we all agree, let's get over it? We ready? Can we all agree, let's get over it? Say yes. We're going to get over that. We're going to move past that because it doesn't matter in the long run. Don't get your feelings hurt because somebody doesn't know your name. Because it costs too much to buy the name tag, so just ask. Man, I just made some brownie points with stewardship. Let me... Just ask. Or here, even better yet, don't assume they know it. Hi, my name is. In the, back, the devil's going to be in the back of your mind. I told him my name. I've told him my name four times. Why don't they remember my name? It just makes me spitting mad. They don't remember. My, get over it. Let's get over it. We all said yes. Hi, my name is. Hi, my name is. Hi, my name is. It's okay. Because we're family. There you go. And as we've been doing throughout this time together, let's learn to laugh a little bit more. Let's find the joy in one another. Proverbs 17 and verse 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Let's laugh a little bit more. You realize not everything has to be as serious as we make it. We can enjoy what we do here it's okay smile a little bit more laugh a little bit more you know it actually is proven smiling uses less muscles than frowning it's proven so all of you are just doing more workout than necessary just saying you have a resting face change it 
You do. We all do. Let's laugh a little bit more together. If we're going to lead well individually in our families, we're going to lead well as a church in this community, we love God, we engage multiple generations, we actively listen, we develop mentoring relationships, we work together, we evangelize in a modern culture, let's linger together and let's laugh together. This is the way of wisdom. Thank you.